Hello from the Wednesday class. Uh, since we finished the course material on Monday, uh, today we will just make um, a short revision and also we will solve, uh, solve some examples uh, for your exam on Friday. Um, again, since we are done uh, with the material today, this lecture will be our last lecture and on Friday there will not be any class since you have an exam. Um, so uh, I think after the second exam, uh, we started with the eigenvalues. So I uh, tried to prepare the practice exam um, with respect to the sections that we covered. So we will start with the eigenvalue analysis. Then uh, we will look at some questions for uh, the orthogonal projections and orthogonal complements, uh, diagonalization, then um, what else, the least squares problems, blah, blah. So we will solve uh, some questions. Again, uh, if you remember, um, uh, probably you checked already in the canvas, you can find the practice exam already. So I will just go over uh, the questions. Let me first share my screen. Okay, so like this. Oops. Okay, so I think we have, uh, how many questions? We have eight questions in total with some uh, different sections. So let's start. The first question is uh, an eigenvalue problem. So we have five by, um, Four, four. Oh, I'm sorry, I was just, wow. So this is just a four by five mat matrix because uh, my eyes can see well, because otherwise how can you find the eigenvalues for an arbitrary matrix? Okay, fine. So it's a four by four matrix, good. So we have a four by four matrix here and we, we want to find the eigenvalues of this matrix and we will determine the algebraic multiplicities. Then we will find uh, the basis vectors for the corresponding eigenspaces. And then we will decide if our matrix is diagonalizable or not. So in fact, all these questions are related to each other because if you have a square matrix, if you start to do eigenvalue analysis, then of course, after finding the eigenvalues, we are generally finding the corresponding eigenvectors. If you are finding the eigenvectors, it means that already you are finding a basis for the corresponding eigenspace. Then just by looking at the number of the eigenvectors and the size of your matrix, you can immediately decide if your matrix is diagonalizable. Or we gave some theorems here, if you remember. Uh, we said a matrix, if uh, in your matrix, if all the eigenvalues are distinct, then your matrix will be diagonalizable. But if you have some multiplicity in your eigenvalues, we cannot say anything. It doesn't mean that your matrix is diagonalizable or it's not diagonalizable. We cannot say anything, so we have to look at the number of the eigenvectors or you have to make the analysis. All right, let's start. Uh, finding the eigenvalues of a matrix is the easiest thing because we already know how to do it. We will just find the um, characteristic polynomial then we will just look at the roots of this characteristic polynomial. Uh, to find the characteristic polynomial, you have to first define a minus lambda i, where lambda is just a constant, and these lambdas will be the eigenvalues. So here, firstly, you need to find a minus lambda i, and this matrix will be the a minus lambda i matrix, and then you will find the determinant of this matrix. We know how to find the determinant. Again, um, if you recall it, so you can find the determinant of this matrix with respect to any row or any column. I think since the last row has many zeros here, you can start, uh, you can find the determinant with respect to the fourth row. So if you are gonna use this last row, what will you do? You have to remember the sign pattern here. So you will start with plus, minus, plus, minus. So this is minus, plus, minus, plus. So here, the last enter will tell you there should be a plus in front of it. Plus, right, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus. Yes, there should be a 
plus in front of this. So you will just find uh, the you will just find plus two minus lambda times cover of the corresponding column and the row. Then you will find the determinant of this three by three matrix. So since you have zeros here, they will not be effective. Okay. So so with respect to that, now when you do the calculations, as you see, uh, you will get uh, two and one as the eigenvalues. So you have to, normally here, I have four by four matrix. So for four by four matrix, I expect to find at most four eigenvalues. It can be less, but at most four. So here, when you do the calculations, I see that I have two eigenvalues because I have algebraic multiplicity here because the eigenvalue two appears three times in my polynomial. So my eigenvalues are two and one. And if you look at the algebraic multiplicity for the eigenvalue two, my algebraic multiplicity is three and for the eigenvalue one, my algebraic multiplicity is one. So this is the answer of the first question. So the second part asks find basis for eigenspaces. So what does that mean? It means that for each eigenvalue, you have to find the corresponding eigenvectors. Okay. Or it means that in order to find the eigenvector, you have to look at the corresponding null space. For example, if you are working with the eigenvalue two, and if you are looking for an eigenvector for two, then you have to look at, um, in fact, you, to find the eigenvector, you need to solve AX equals two X, which means that just solve the equation a minus two i x equals zero, or to find this x, since it's a homogeneous system, it's equivalent to find the null space of this um, matrix here, a minus two i for the, again, uh, eigenvalue two. So if you look at this uh, null space, what will you do? Finding the null space of this matrix means, again, you need to solve a minus two i x equals zero, so how can you solve a system of linear equations? It's an homogeneous equation. The only way is you have to write the augmented matrix, apply the row operations, and then you write the solution set. So you start with a minus two i, you can write this as augmented matrix with the dashed lines, you can write here zero. After applying the row operations, so this matrix will be um, row equivalent to this echelon form, okay? Um, in this echelon form, again, if you want, you can add this last uh, column here. It, it will be completely zero since this is a homogeneous system. Uh, with respect to that, now, how can you find the eigenvectors? In fact, here I just gave a little bit sketch of the proof. Um, please try to do the calculations by yourself. I think it, it uh, would be a good practice for your fingers. Um, so after uh, the row operations, when you simplify this matrix to so this echelon form, what will you do now? You will write your system again, 2x1 minus 3x2 plus 6x3 is zero. And then x4 is zero. And I don't have anything else. So with respect to that, what are your basic variables and free variables? As you see here, this is your basic variable and this is your basic variable. You have two free variables. And since you have two free variables, again, remember, so what we'll be doing, the number of the free variables will determine the dimension of your null space for this matrix, okay? The number of the free variables is two. It means that the dimension of this, uh, the null space of this matrix or dimension of this space will be two, which means that you need to find two basis vectors for this uh, null space. So here, after you write the uh, equations again, you know, uh, you will just determine the free variables again, the x2 and x3 will be the free variables. So with respect to that, uh, with the choice, special choice of x2 and x3, you can find two eigenvectors here, and they will be basis vectors for your null space. And similarly, um, for the eigenvalue one, we will do the same thing. So you need to find the null space of a minus one i or a minus i. So you need to show a minus i x equals zero. 
again, just write the augmented matrix applied row operations and this, this matrix will be row equivalent to this one. So from here, you can just write the simplified equations x1 minus x2 equals zero, x3 is zero, x4 is zero. So as you see here, this is basic variable, basic and basic. So you have three basic variables and one free variable. So the number of um, the free variables is one, which means that the dimension of your null space for the corresponding eigenvalue one will be one. So we expect to find only one eigenvector here. And really, if you do the calculations in your, on your simplified system, you will find this eigenvalue, uh, this eigenvector, sorry. So this actually answers the second part of this question. We found the basis uh, vectors for the corresponding eigenspaces. But what's the relation between uh, the eigenvectors and the um, question of um, A is diagonalizable or not? Um, so again, as I said, there are a few ways to decide that. If you had distinct eigenvalues, uh, we were gonna say, okay, so I can use the theorem, all the eigenvalues are distinct, A is diagonalizable. But unfortunately, Already, while I was expect to find four eigenvalues, I only find two eigenvalues. So there is multiplicity here, which means that I cannot use that theorem. So this doesn't give me anything. But instead, what can I do? Just remember the diagonalization. What does that mean? Um, if a matrix A is diagonalizable, it means that you can find uh, matrices P, D, P inverse, uh, such that you can decompose your matrix A into P, D, P inverse. I mean, you can write your matrix A as the product of these matrices in the, in the order P times D times P inverse. So here, D, at finding this D will be easy. D is just a diagonal matrix, which has the eigenvalues of your matrix as the main diagonal. And P matrix will be obtained uh, by the eigenvectors of your matrix A. So we said, you will find the eigenvalues, you will write the D matrix, okay? To find P for each eigenvalue, you have to find the corresponding eigenvectors to write as the columns of P matrix. Since every eigenvector, um, or let's say the set of eigenvectors will be linearly independent, then the columns of your P matrix will be uh, linearly independent, which means that P is invertible. Already in default, P will be invertible and you can define P inverse. But um, here, how can we decide immediately, we, just without making the calculation, how can we decide if A is diagonalizable? In order to say that A is diagonalizable, you need to look at the number of your eigenvectors. How many eigenvectors you find for each eigenvalue? Because at the end, P, again, as I said, P matrix will be found by the eigenvectors and the columns of your P will be the eigenvectors. So for this matrix, Look at the size of this matrix. First of all, A is four by four. So you will write, you are trying to write this matrix as the product of P, D, P inverse. So your P matrix here should be four by four. So to write this matrix, you need four eigenvectors. So every column of P will come from the eigenvectors. So I need four eigenvectors. If I can find four eigenvectors, it means that A will be diagonalizable. But in B, in the second part of the question, I find the corresponding eigenvectors for the eigenvalues two and one. And what we said for two, although the algebraic multiplicity is three, I can find only two eigenvectors. So I lost one of the eigenvectors already here. So I have just two eigenvectors. For the eigenvalue one, I just find one eigenvector. So in total, I find three eigenvectors, which is not enough to write P matrix, because again, to write P matrix, I need four eigenvectors. So we can immediately say, since we don't have enough eigenvectors, A will not be diagonalizable. All right? Okay. So in short, you are gonna look at the number of the eigenvectors. The number of the eigenvectors should match with the size of your matrix. Okay. Look at the second question. Um, this will be a very similar question. This is just three by three matrix. 
And in this question, we will find the complex eigenvalues of a matrix A. So there's no difference in the method because um, whatever the roots are, at the end, you have to find the characteristic polynomial and you have to find the roots. So you need to find first A minus lambda I, then this will be the A minus lambda I matrix and its determinant. As you see here, I have just zero in, on the second row. So you can use either first column or second row for, to find the determinant. Uh, I think it will make the things easier, but it's up to you. You can use any row, any column. Uh, at the end, the, the determinant of this matrix will be uh, given like that. So here, what are the roots? If you make it zero, the roots will be zero. And as you see here, I have complex roots. I cannot find the real roots, but that's okay. Uh, the roots will be 9i minus 9i. So the important thing here, um, if you have a complex root in your equation, it means that its conjugate also has to be a root. So if you have 9i as an eigenvalue, its conjugate minus 9i should also be an eigenvalue. And if you remember, it, it's true for also eigenvectors. So uh, for example, it's not asked in this question, but if you want to find the eigenvectors here also, uh, for each eigenvalue, you need to find an eigenvector. For zero, it's easy. You will just apply the same method that we did before. For 9i, Again, it will be same, but uh, instead of working with the real numbers, now you have to work with complex numbers. You have to be careful. Um, but the good thing here, if you find the eigenvector for this uh, first, the second eigenvalue 9i, then uh, it's, it will be enough for us. You don't have to find another eigenvector for minus 9i. You don't have to make the calculations again because the, uh, if you find the eigenvector for 9i, then uh, its conjugate will be the eigenvector also for the conjugate eigenvalue, okay? All right. So look at the third question. It's a bit tricky question. Um, before solving the question, we need to understand what it says. So we have some vectors. We have four vectors here, which are given in R5, because they have five entries. And we have a set, which is defined as the spanning set of these four vectors, okay? And the question is, find a vector which is in the spanning set of Wperp. What's Wperp here? Wperp means find a vector which should be in the orthogonal complement of your uh, space W. Or this vector uh, V5 should be orthogonal to all these vectors. Well, so you can just think like, um, I'm going to find a vector which will be orthogonal to all these vectors. So what can you do here? You can just say, um, v5 can be like x1, x2, x3, x4, x5. And this will be orthogonal all these vectors. So you can just multiply this v5 and v1, it will be zero. So you will get a, a system of, you will get one equation there. Then you will write again v5 char, uh, times v2 will be zero. v5 times v3 will be zero v5 uh, times v4 will be zero. But here we say times, it means you are just multiplying the vectors. So it means that you are working with the inner product or dot product. Uh, you have to use the definition of the dot product here. So with this way, you can obtain four different equations with five unknowns. So you will get a system of linear equations Okay, you can solve this equation by easily because you will get a system of homogeneous equations and you can just write the coefficient matrix, apply the row operations, you can find the solution set. This is the first way and it's a very long way. But instead, here we can use the theorem actually. So what can we do? You want to find the bully perp. 
orthogonal complement of W. So how can I represent this W here? It's given as the spanning set of these vectors. So what happens if I write these all, ve all four vectors as the columns of a matrix A? Assume that they are the columns of a matrix A. And if you have this A matrix here, what does the spanning set mean here? Just go back to uh, the definition of the column space, null space, row space. If you have a matrix with these columns, the spanning set of the columns of your matrix will define the column space of your matrix. So the spanning set of V1, V2, V3, V4, which is defined as W in the question, so W will automatically be the column space of your, of your matrix. Okay, so I just identified this W as the column space of a matrix A uh, whose columns will be these vectors. So this is now my vector, uh, matrix A. All right, then I want to find the orthogonal complement of W. But if you remember, we gave a very useful formula and we gave the orthogonal complement of the column space of a matrix will be equivalent to the null space of A transpose. So this last equality, the second equality here is the theorem. Uh, but in order to use this theorem, again, we are trying, we try to identify this W as the column space. Because how can you, this w, your W set here? This is the theorem. So we, since we define this A, and the column space will be the W set. Now, instead of uh, the orthogonal complement of column space of A, now you can write W perp. So W perp will be equivalent to the null space of A transpose, which is now very easy because I know what to find. I will find the, the space W perp because I, if I can characterize W perp, I will already find a vector there because at the same time, you will find a basis vector and it will be enough for us. So W perp will be the null space of A transpose. So finding W perp now um, is equivalent to finding the null space of A transpose. Since we already define A as this matrix, it's easy to find the transpose, then find the null space of this matrix by solving A transpose X equals to zero. So this is your A transpose. Now I'm going to solve A transpose X equals zero. So for this, you need to apply uh, the row operations, uh, row reduction algorithm to reduce this A transpose to this matrix. Um, I didn't write the zero column here, but uh, since this is a homogeneous matrix, uh, we are always keeping this in our mind. It's easy. So this is now the simplified uh, echelon form. In fact, this is the reduced echelon form. So here, what can you say? Basic, 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 basic. These are all basic variables. And this last one will be uh, the free variable. So you have only one free variable. What can you do now? Now you write the simplified system x1, x2, x3, x4, x5. So x1 plus 1 over 3, x5 equals 0. And x2 plus 7 over 15, uh, x5 equals 0. So I'm just writing uh, with respect to each row. And then since uh, the last one, v5 uh, or x5 will be your uh, free variable, with, the, with respect to a special choice of your free variable, you will get one basis uh, vector there in this null space. Because remember again, the dimension of the null space of A transpose should be the number of the free variables in this matrix. So the number of the free variables is one. So the dimension should be one. I will obtain just one vector. Uh, this will be the basis for your null space and it can be chosen as V5, which will really orthogonal to all these V vectors. You can easily check this, okay? It's really an interesting question, I think. All right, so for question four, um, we have, for vectors here, so again, we have a, sub, uh, we have a space, subspace, uh, which is spanned by these four vectors. And we have also a y vector here. And the question is, 
find the vector in W closest to Y. So this is a question related to least squares problem or uh, orthogonal projection because we are generally using with uh, the, the uh, sentence like best approximation, the closest one, the uh, shortest distance. So we are generally saying these sentences either in orthogonal projections or uh, least squares problems. Okay, but so at the end you have a space W spanned by four vectors. So this will uh, give you a kind of plane and you have a vector Y, which is not in the spanning set. So we are trying to find uh, a vector in your subspace. Let's say this is your W, okay? So this entire plane is your W and you have a vector here, which is Y. We are trying to find the closest distance between this Y and W. So how can you find this? Again, here, I think, since Y is not in your spanning set, to find this uh, distance here, you need to find the orthogonal projection of your Y vector onto the subspace W. So this is a kind of projection uh, problem. So in order to find uh, the orthogonal projection, because that uh, orthogonal projection vector will be the closest vector to your vector y. But if it asks you to find the shortest distance between y and the space w, then you have to find that difference, okay? Uh, again, if you remember, we were de uh, decomposing every vector y as y hat plus z. And then if you are looking for the shortest distance, then you have to find the length of this z vector, not the projection vector. But here we are trying to find the closest vector, which will be the projection vector. But in order to find the projection of Y onto this space, subspace W, what we need? Can you find the orthogonal projection of a vector onto an arbitrary subspace? No. First of all, your subspace is spanned by four vectors and to find the projection, all these vectors should be orthogonal. And they should form an orthogonal basis for this subspace, okay? If they are not orthogonal, then uh, you cannot find the orthogonal projection. So, um, well, how can you understand that all these vectors, first of all, linearly independent? What can you do? Because some of them just might destroy the game, they might be linearly dependent even. So you have to remove the linearly, uh, linearly dependent vectors. So first you need to start with the linearly independent vectors, but it's not enough. You have to apply the gram schmidt and you have to obtain an um, orthogonal set here. But in order to understand if these vectors are linearly independent, you can just write them as the columns of a matrix then you can apply the operations, you can determine the free and basic variables. For example, here, the first three columns will be the, uh, will determine the pivot positions, but here, this vector uh, doesn't have a pivot position, which means that the last vector should be removed from here. Or in another uh, verse, U4 will be linearly dependent with the others. So you have to remove it firstly, to obtain a linearly independent set. So uh, <clears throat> since U4 will be linearly dependent with the others, now you can write W as the spanning set of U1, U2, U3. Just remove it. Okay, by just looking at this. So start with working with these three vectors. Now the column space, these vectors will be the basis for your column space. So you are starting with them. They are linearly independent. They are spanning column space. That's good, they are bases, but they are not orthogonal. So in order to find orthogonal projection, I need orthogonal bases. So how can you make this set orthogonal? By applying the Gram-Schmidt process. So you will apply the Gram-Schmidt process to these three vectors to orthogonalize them. So what is the process from these U1, U2, U3, you will obtain a new set, orthogonal set, which is V1, V2, V3. So what is the process? The algorithm says, as V1 choose U1, then as V2 choose U2 minus the projection of U2 onto V1, then find V2 here. You will just make the necessary 
inner products. That's it. And similarly for V3, V3 should be U3 minus the projection of uh, U3 onto the subspace, which is spent by V1 and V2. Actually, you, if you can put this minus here, then uh, you will get plus here. Okay, so you will get the third vector. Now, these new vectors will form an orthogonal basis for the column space of your matrix. So what can you do now? Since you have an orthogonal basis, you can immediately find the orthogonal projection of your y vector onto this W set by applying the formula, orthogonal projection formula. Okay, and this is the answer. All right, so the fifth question is, this is a kind of, uh, as you see, um, least squares problem because we are working with the best approximation. Apparently we cannot solve a system exactly. We cannot find a solution. That's the reason we are trying to find the best approximation. So we have a matrix A, a vector B, find the closest thing to a solution to the linear system A x equals B is measured by the error. And give a parametric description of the set of all such best approximations. So it says a lot of things here, but so what should we understand? We need to solve this system, AX equals B. So there are two cases. This system might be consistent or not inconsistent. If the system consistent, then no need to worry because you can just apply the uh, row operations. You can find an exact solution here. And since you will find an exact solution, you will not even have an error there. But apparently, Please check this um, by yourself. This system will not be consistent, so you cannot find a solution set. That's the reason we are trying to find the best approximation. Best approximation mean I cannot find an exact solution X, but can I find a solution X hat where A X hat will be very, very close to this P matrix. So X hat, will not, X hat will be the least square solution, but X hat will not solve the system uh, exactly. Instead, by this X hat, you will find an error, but this error will be very, very small because that will be the best approximation to this P. All right, so we need to find the least square solution. And if you remember, in order to find the least square solution, uh, you have two methods you can immediately apply this formula. We generated this formula, if you remember, by using the column space, some orthogonality, or you can use the QR factorization of your matrix A. If you have, I mean, uh, applying the second method is not that wise if you don't already have the QR factorization in your hand because you have to find Q and R matrices. It, it's already a long process. So instead, I think applying this formula is easier, but in a way, in your question, if you previously obtained already Q and R matrices, then it's easy to apply QR method. But here, since we don't have the Q and R matrices in our hand, I think uh, we can start with this formula. So we have to solve this normal equation here, A transpose A X equals A transpose B. So instead of solving this system, well, it's already not consistent. So you are gonna solve this new system of linear equations and it's always consistent. So to solve this, you need to find A transpose A. This will give you a new matrix and the right hand side will give you a new vector. So you need to solve a new system of equations, non-homogeneous equations. And again, to find the uh, solution, you are writing the augmented matrix and apparently here, A transpose A is giving you this matrix with the four columns and this last, uh, last column is coming from this right hand side, this from this vector. So this is the augmented matrix. When you apply the operations, you will get this new echelon form. So here, if you just write or all your equations again, uh, you can write the parametric uh, your solution in parametric way uh, by using this free variable. Okay. Uh, so with a special choice of x4, you can find a solution which will be uh, the least square solution to your problem or already you will be the best approximation to this B vector, okay? All right. 
The other um, question is a kind of application of least squares problems. If you remember, um, we said the least squares problem problems have an application into a real world problems, especially this kind of stuff uh, is used, uh, especially in statistics or in data science. So if you have a lot of data in your hand, you, are, you might uh, want to find a curve where your data uh, is collected around, uh, I mean, um, around which curve your uh, data are collected. So this can be a line, this can be a parabola, this can be a cubic function, or this can be a trigonometric function like that. So it doesn't matter. At the end, we have some data points here. I, we, we give you four data points with X and Y values. Um, we want to find a function that best approximates the data. So which means that we will find a function F uh, with respect to this data, we will at the end, we will say this data, these points will be uh, around actually this uh, curve. So this will be the um, best approximation curve to these data. Okay, so what will we do here in order to solve this question? In a way, we have to bring this, uh, all this question into a system. So our main purpose here to write this system firstly as uh, the system of linear equations x beta equals y. So what's x, what's beta, what's y here? That's the issue. So here, if you remember for this kind of problems, we said you have an observed value for y values, also you have um, predicted value. So if you can find these coefficients beta zero, beta one, beta two, then we will be done. So with the choice of these xi values, if you write them here, then the image, I mean, for each xi, fxi will be the predicted value because we are trying to find these beta values. But here, this one, three, minus two, and five refer to um, observed values. They are already given. So everything is just, um, based on writing a system of linear equation, the system of equations uh, where on the left hand side we have the uh, predicted values for y values and on the right hand side we should have the observed values. So as you see here, these are the observed values for y values given in my data and left hand side are with respect to this f, these are all the pre predicted values for y values. So they have to be very close. Actually, we are writing equivalent. It means that we are trying to find an approximation. We are trying to find the best result, uh, best coefficients, which will make, for example, this left-hand side very close to one. So that's the reason we are trying to say this the least, uh, least uh, squares problem this is. So uh, if you can write all these equations, then the left part will be easy because for each xi value, they are minus one, minus one half, one, four, uh, one over four, three over two. So these are your xi values. When you put instead of x, all your xi values, now you will get here four different equations. So for each xi value, these sine and cosine functions will give you a constant actually. So by these constants, you will get beta zero plus, for example, here, this will be zero, okay? Beta zero plus zero times beta one plus one times beta two equals one. So here from the first row, the first row means one zero one times beta zero, beta one, beta two. So if you multiply the first row and this first column, you will get the first line. So you, if you do the same thing for the other uh, lines, you will get this coefficient matrix, which will be this X matrix. Already this beta is my coefficients matrix. I'm trying to find all these beta values. And Y will be uh, the <clears throat> Y vector, which has the uh, observed values of 
for these old y, y i values. Okay, so if you write this system already, then the left part is easy because I know that this system is not consistent. So that's the reason I'm trying to find the best coefficients, which will uh, make x beta very, very close to my y values. And as I did in the previous question, this is my formula to find the least square solution. I'm trying to find a beta hat actually. So if you know x matrix, you will find x transpose x, x transpose y, and you will solve the SNP system here. So you will write the augmented matrix, apply the row operations, then determine the free variable. As you see, this last one will be the free variable. Write the system again, and then with the special choice of your free variable, you will find a beta vector. And these will be your coefficients. So the best approximating function, function around your data points will be this function, okay? So everything is based on writing this system X actually. All right, so look at seven. Um, we have a matrix A, it's three by three matrix. We have two vectors, V1 and V2. The question has three sections. We say compute a V1, A, V2. Okay, it's easy. What did you just discover? Okay, we will see. Find an orthogonal diagonalization of A. Okay, so the first two is easy. What about the last one? Find an orthogonal diagonalization. First of all, what's orthogonal diagonalization? So in order to find an orthogonal diagonalization, first of all, your mat matrix A should be symmetric because we said every symmetric matrix has an orthogonal diagonalization. So probably the first two parts will help me. Let's find AV1 and AV2. It's easy, just product matrix and vector. So you will see that AV1, look at this vector and V1, if you multiply this V1 by nine, you will get this. So AV1 will be equivalent to nine times V1. So here you can say, well, then nine will be the eigenvalue for my matrix A and actually V1 will be the corresponding eigenvector. And similarly for AV2, AV2 is this, and if you multiply V2 by minus nine, you will get this matrix, this vector. So which means that AV2 is equivalent to minus nine V2. So minus nine will be an eigenvalue and V2 will be the corresponding eigenvector. Okay, so this already answers the first two parts. What about the last part? Find an orthogonal diagonalization. The first thing, check if your matrix is symmetric. What does that mean? A symmetric matrix means A should be A transpose. Really, A is equivalent to A transpose. It's a symmetric matrix and every symmetric matrix should have an orthogonal diagonalization. In orthogonal diagonalization, the only difference is you have to decompose your matrix A again into three parts, P, D, P transpose, because since you have a symmetric matrix, then P inverse and P transpose will be the same matrices. Um, so you have to do some eigenvector analysis here, an eigenvalue eigenvector. For we said you have two eigenvalues here already, nine and minus nine. Okay, so for each eigenvalue, you can find a corresponding eigenvector. Um, okay, so we know that these are eigenvalues, but well, our matrix is three by three matrix, so we can have actually three eigenvalues. So how can you guarantee that there is not any other eigenvalue here? Well, we cannot guarantee unless you do the calculations, but here the important thing is for each eigenvalue, if you, after making the eigenvector analysis, if you can find enough number of eigenvectors, then already your A will be diagonalizable. You don't need to find the other one. So I expect to find two eigenvectors for one of these two eigenvalues. If I can find two eigenvectors, at least one for one of these eigenvalues, then I will already find another eigenvector for the other one. I will at least in total, I will get three eigenvectors. Then I will be done. It means that already there is no other eigenvalue. So here, if you find the corresponding eigenvectors, for example, for uh, nine, for the eigenvalue nine, you will get really two eigenvectors, so, which is good. 
So here I get two eigenvectors for the other eigenvalue minus nine, I get another eigenvector. So in total, I obtain three eigenvectors, which is enough to diagonalize my matrix. But since I want to find an orthogonal diagonalization, I need an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors. That is uh, the basic definition of orthogonal diagonalization. Because in this P matrix, all the columns of P should be the orthonormal eigenvectors. Having just the eigenvector is not enough. Your eigenvectors should be orthogonal and also unit vectors. We already know that for symmetric matrices, uh, different the eigenvectors corresponding to distinct eigenvalues will be orthogonal. But we cannot say the same thing for the eigenvectors which are found for the same eigenvalue. For example, here, for the eigenvalue 9, we find two eigenvectors. If you check, they are not orthogonal. But these eigenvectors will be orthogonal with the other one, which is for the other eigenvalue. So here, one of them, one of these eigenvectors destroy the game. So what can I do? If you want, you can apply the gram schmidt process to orthogonalize all these eigenvectors. Uh, you can use the usual algorithm to these, for these three vectors. Or uh, since y1 and y2 are already orthogonal to y3, uh, I wouldn't touch y3. I would just take it. But instead, I apply the gram schmidt process to these two vectors to orthogonalize them because they are not orthogonal. So essentially, I'm doing this. I'm just applying the gram schmidt for y1 and y2, and I'm finding another vector. Then I'm normalizing them because I need unit vectors. And at the end, this set of vectors will be uh, orthonormal eigenvectors for me. So I'm just writing all these vectors after normalizing them as the columns of this P matrix, okay? These are all, again, orthonormal eigenvectors. And since I know that these are my eigenvalues, I'm writing all these eigenvalues in the respective order, okay? So this will be the orthogonal uh, diagonalization for me. All right. So the last question is related to quadratic forms. Uh, we learned them in very recently. So uh, if you have a quadratic form, then it means that you should be able to find the associated matrix and your matrix should be symmetric. Every symmetric matrix has a quadratic form and the definition, the quadratic form, it's a kind of function which is defined as X transpose AX. Uh, so A is the associated matrix. Or if you already have the quadratic form, um, I told you the procedure, you can always find the associated matrix. For example, here the question, your quadratic form is defined on R3 so it has three different uh, entries, x1, x2, x3, and it's going to R. The questions are if the norm of x, of the, if the length of a, or if uh, x is a unit vector, then how large can qx be? It means that what's the maximum and minimum values for qx and classify q as a positive definite, negative definite, or indefinite. So we already learned how to find all these things, but the key step, the first key step is if you know the quadratic form, you have to write down your matrix, the associated matrix. So here, since it's defined on R3, your associated matrix should be three by three matrix. It should be symmetric matrix. Okay, how can I write my matrix? Just look at the form of your quadratic function. Here, look at the square terms. Their coefficients should be written to the diagonal. So for the first one, minus six, second one, minus two, and I don't have x3 square here. It means that the coefficient is zero. So I'm writing minus six, minus two, zero on the diagonal. Then look at the cross product terms, x1, x2. This term will correspond to the entry a12 or a21, since my matrix will be symmetric, or this term will correspond to a13, a31. And there is no x3, x2, x3 term, it means that the coefficient is zero. So how am I going to dis distribute all these coefficients? Again, as I told you, look at the coefficient. You have to divide this coefficient by two, and then you have to write uh, the result to, uh, the, for example, to enter a12, a21. So write three to a12, a21. Uh, then for the entry a13 and a31, 
divide minus 4 by 2 minus 2, write it to a13 and a31. And then, since I don't have the other cross product term, the coefficient should be zero. So this is my matrix. Now, if you know the matrix, the left part will be easy because again, by theorem, we said the quadratic form will change between the minimum and maximum eigenvalues of your associated matrix. So you have to find the eigenvalues of your this matrix. If you find the characteristic polynomial and determinant, you will find that the eigenvalues will be one minus one and minus eight. So it means that your quadratic form for any unit vector X will change between the minimum eigenvalue and maximum eigenvalue. Okay, so this is given already as a theorem. And lastly, how can you classify your quadratic form? We said if the eigenvalues of the associated matrix are all positive, your matrix will be positive definite. If they are all negative, it will be negative definite. But if you have both positive and negative eigenvalues, it will be indefinite. So here, as you see, we have both positive and negative eigenvalues, so it will be indefinite, okay? So I think um, these are the everything that I can say. Um, so this is our last lecture. Um, um, I don't know what to say. Although we are in the middle of the pandemic, everything uh, is really difficult, but still I really enjoyed the linear algebra class. I wish I could see and interact with, uh, with you, my students. I wish we could just go to the board, share our ideas, solve the questions, but we couldn't do that, unfortunately. Uh, but I hope you enjoyed my uh, videos, my lectures. Uh, I, I really hope that I could teach you something here. Um, so I don't know what, what else I can say. So I wish you all a great break. Please enjoy your break, but uh, try uh, to be very careful, please and uh, stay warm, stay safe, okay? So let me stop sharing. Still, if you have any question uh, about the exam or any, anything, just uh, you can send me email, okay? Okay, so bye-bye.